All right, we're in the last week of this series called on um, James called The Upside. And uh, James has given us practical advice on how to persevere in hard times. And uh, if you missed any of it, no problem. Go back and check it wherever you stream content. And um, I think you'll be blessed, encouraged. I think it'll grow your faith. Um, but today we're gonna close it out. James type takes a little bit of a turn. So far, it's been really practical. Matter of fact, James is called by some scholars the wisdom book of the New Testament. If Proverbs is the wisdom book of the Old Testament, James is the wisdom book of the New Testament. So he tells us practical things like, how to deal with trials and temptations, how to uh, tame the tongue, <laughs> the thing that can get you in trouble. Um, we talked about in week three, how to live with an eternal perspective, that, that, that lo- the earth isn't all it's about, that I'm living for something greater. We talked about that. Um, had a phenomenal day last week, Mother's Day. What an incredible panel we had. I hope you didn't miss that. If you did, go online. Such powerful stories. And then we're going to close this out, and James takes a little bit of a turn because he goes from very practical, like how to, into a very important spiritual truth um, that we want to give you today. How many of you are creatures of habit? Come on, every location. Come on, Richmond. You creatures of habit, right? Right. I'm a very, I'm very um, habit person. I believe in the power of habits in your life. I think your life is the summation of all your habits. Um, so I'm big on daily routine. I'm, I'm, somebody said if I was a baseball player, I guess they're known to be a little superstitious, that I would never change my socks if I was winning. I was like, probably not. I'm just like, habit. I know if you give me a name a restaurant, I'll tell you what I'm ordering if I've been there. I don't even need to look at the menu. Um, I, I do the same things. I, matter of fact, I have four lunch orders and my assistant surprises me each day. You're like, that's boring. I was like, no, it's efficient. I waste, I don't waste time trying to make a decision. I make enough decisions. Come on, somebody, I'm saving bandwidth. Um, I kind of wear similar things. Like I'm just, I like habits, I like routines. I do the same thing every Sunday. I get up at the same time every Sunday. I go through the same routine every Sunday. Are y'all following me? Like I just like habits. I I just, I enjoy habits. I think it's, they're good. And um, some of you, you're, you're like, if you're into Enneagram, the witchcraft stuff about personalities, <laughs> I'm joking, joking. Some of you are like sevens. You're like, you're a party waiting to happen. You just show up and here you are. Here's the party. You don't like habits. We, we need you. You're just not as efficient. So <laughs> like you, I just don't want to work with you. And so I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I need those people in my life because if not, I'm very boring. Come on, somebody. And so some of us, though, we just have like, we live life and we form habits and habits are really just um, entrenched like go-to patterns in our life, Right. Some are healthy, some are not healthy, right? We all have them. Some of us, we got like go-to patterns. I don't know about you, but I, like when I go to a baseball stadium, I lose my mind on my diet. Like I just eat everything in sight, hot dogs. Wow. It's a pattern I've created that when I go, are y'all tracking with me? And I think whenever life happens at us, a lot of us, we have a pattern we go to or we have a habit that's just kind of our natural go-to. That when life is challenging, some of us, we just go to fear, It's just the natural like fear is what happens. Some of us, we have the habit that whenever life is challenging, we go to worry, we go to stress, we we go to anxiety, we we go to isolation, we go to tears, we we, we just have the go-to. It's it's kind of a habit almost that we've formed into our life. It's, It's the emotional response, it's the natural response. And in this last chapter of the book of James, James wants to offer us a natural, what can become a natural response, but may not be natural right now. And I want to offer it to you. And I think when I offer it to you at first, you're going to be like, oh, okay, it's church. You're a preacher. You're supposed to say that. But I hope to show you by the end of the day, and I hope to stir something in you by the end of the day that you go, no, I'm going to make this my natural habit. And what's, what becomes a habit starts as a discipline. Are you all with me? Nobody really likes running. Starts as a discipline. No one really likes eating well. Starts as a discipline. Are you following me? And this may start as a discipline, but I pray it becomes your go-to habit in your life. And if it does, I think it has the power to change your life. If you're tracking, say amen. All right, James chapter five, verse 13. I want to read this to you. It says, if anyone, is anyone among you in trouble, let them, everybody say, what's the next word? Let them. All right, let them pray. That's, that's it. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to 
pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Time out, quick little thought there is 1 John 1, 9, confess your sins to God for forgiveness, but you confess to each other for healing. So some of you have been healed, but you're still broken because you live in isolation and you don't take the mask off for anybody. And you can never find healing until you're willing to open up your wound to somebody else. God uses the body, heals the body. That's why you need church and the people of God. So that's why you need a small group. Anyways, next. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And so James all of a sudden goes from all these like practical things, go listen to those other messages, and he goes this really deep spiritual truth about prayer five times. In that short few verses, he says, pray or prayer, pray or prayer. There's really power in prayer. And you gotta know you're in a church that really believes in the power of prayer, that we really do believe that if you're in trouble, prayer can get you out of trouble. That if you're sick, prayer can heal your body. We, we've literally, not just like it's, it's a nice little preacher saying like we've watched it. We've watched cancer disappear. We've watched God do the miraculous among us. And we really believe in the power of prayer. And I wanna stir your faith today towards prayer again. Because some of you, you've put it up on the shelf and you bring it out whenever times are hard or you've tried it and that didn't work for me. And I wanna maybe show you a missing piece today and stir you towards this thing of prayer, because prayer moves you beyond the best you can do into the best God can do. How many of you know we need the best God can do? Not just the best that we can do. And so after the verses we just read, the next verse, James, he moves from this very practical book to this, hey, by the way, if anybody's in trouble, pray. If you're sick, pray. If you're in sin, pray. And the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous will avail much or it will produce something. Like something will actually be produced in your life. Now, some of you are thinking, well, that doesn't apply to me because I'm not righteous. And you're right. You're not. Especially at the Spotsy campus. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm kidding. Just seeing if you're awake over there at Spotsy. And some of us think, well, I'm exempt from that because I'm not righteous. We exempt ourselves for two reasons. I'm going to show you the second one in a minute. But the first one is because we go, well, we're not righteous. And you're right. The Bible does say there's none righteous, no, not one. So how do we reconcile that only righteous people get their prayers prayer answered, but none is righteous, no, not one? How do I reconcile the two things? They seem to clash with one another, but they don't because there was one righteous and his name was Jesus. And he died on a cross and then he was buried and he raised again three days later. And if we will place our faith in what he did, his righteousness gets put on our account. So I don't come before God in my own rightness. Righteousness, another way to think about that is rightness. I don't come before God in my own rightness because if I came before him on my account, then I would be in a lot of trouble, y'all, because I got issues and you got issues. Don't act like you don't. You got issues. I read prayer requests that come in. You got issues. We all got issues. We all got some cracked areas in our life. So I don't come in my own righteousness. No, no, I come because I've placed faith in Jesus and his righteousness had been applied to my account. So now I look at that and I go, the, right, the fervent, effectual prayer of the righteous. Who's righteous? Nobody's righteous on their own, but I have rightness and I'm so grateful because of the grace of God in my life. So I don't come in my name. I don't end the prayer go, and in Daniel's name, amen. No, because I have no righteousness, but I come before the throne of God boldly in the name of the righteous one. Oh, come on, I'm preaching better than you're responding right now. And so don't discount your prayer. Don't be like, that doesn't apply to me. No, because you don't come in your name. And if you did, then your prayer would be worthless. But you come in the name that is above every name. That's why we close it in Jesus' name. Not in Bob's name. Not in Tyler's name. Are y'all following me? We come in Jesus' name. And so he says, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. Then the very next verse in verse 17, he goes to an Old Testament illustration to illustrate for us the power of prayer. 
and the power of faith in your prayer. Because prayer works when prayer is brought in faith. And some of us think, oh, my prayers don't work, but I would challenge you, have you brought faith with your prayer? So he says this in chapter five, verse 17. He says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly. He prayed powerfully and effectively that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And then again, he prayed three and a half years later and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. The first reason many of us think that God doesn't want to hear our prayers or our prayers don't work or why even waste our time with prayer. The first one is because we think, well, I'm not righteous and, um, and so God doesn't hear my prayer because I'm not good enough. And then the second reason we think, well, I'm not spiritual enough, I'm just a human. And I love this, that James goes, hey, hey, everybody, listen to me. Elijah, he was human just like us. Elijah was human just like us. He got frustrated just like us. He sinned just like us. He lost his temper just like us. Are y'all tracking with me? When a camel cut him off on 95... He got mad, <laughs> just make sure you're with me. Like, he was human, he was frail. You, you read the Bible and you think these characters in the scripture are like these like, like movie things that, that they just like lived out this script and then they went back to real life. No, this was real life for them. They were human just like us and it said, but he prayed. He was human just like us, but he didn't disqualify his prayers. He was human just like us, but he thought, well, if I become before God who has all power in heaven and in earth, maybe he'll just move on my behalf. He just, he just goes, God, I'll take you at your word and I'll go for it. And he prayed. And when he prayed, it didn't rain. And when he prayed, it started raining. And maybe you're not here and maybe you're like, well, I don't need to pray for like, you know, the cosmos to like shift or something on my behalf. I just need God to help me get over this addiction. Well, maybe if Elijah, who was a man just like us, could cause the clouds to stop up, maybe you who are a human being too, if you'll cry out to your God, maybe he will move on your behalf in the same way. I'm wanting to stir. I feel like I'm on an assignment to stir something in you to go, no, I'm gonna pray. My God hears me when I pray. So I'm going to give you three things about building your faith towards prayer. Number one is this. Find it in 1 Kings 17. We're going to go to this story of Elijah, all right? Everybody, y'all with me on the trip so far? We're leaving James. We're driving over to 1 Kings. And it says, now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe. So weird. You should find more humor in the scripture. I always say the Bible's not boring, you're boring. <laughs> so Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, Ahab was the king, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives whom I'm served, there will be neither dew nor rain. It's not gonna come from the sky and it's not gonna come up from the earth for the next few years except at my word. Elijah goes, I've heard from God and here's the deal, it's not gonna rain. Number one, the number one way Faith builds as faith begins with a word. Faith begins with a word. Now, I'm not talking about a word like the or article or a noun or a verb. I'm talking about Elijah heard from the Lord and now his faith was attached to what God said. Let me say it to you this way. Romans 10, 17 says this. It says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the what? Every campus by the word of God. The word of what? God. The word of the news? Come on. Come on, Pastor. Come on. The word of your granny? Come on. The word of Instagram? No. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Fox News? No. The word of CNN? No. The word of a government leader? But some of us live our lives as though our faith is in those things. You're like, can you go on vacation yet, preacher? <laughs> faith doesn't come from what anybody else has to say. I build my faith when I get a word and I get a word from heaven. 
This is why it's so important that you're in the word every day. I tell you that you'll be emaciated if you only ate once a week and the same is true spiritually. If you only come in here once a week or you only tune in online and you only get a word once a week, then your spirit will be emaciated. Your faith will not grow. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? I've got to hear the word of God. I've got to have the word of God. Why, why do I so protect who I allow to be up before you? Because they better come with a word. And if they don't have a word, then it can't help you and it can't build your faith. Are you following me? I'm not trying to bring you a psychologist. You need a preacher with a word from heaven that can build your faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why I need to open my word. Why? Because when I pray, I'm not just throwing out words into the atmosphere. Do you remember when DeMar Hamlin collapsed this past football season on the field and everybody went to prayer? All of a sudden, we got coaches being fired because they lead prayer, but now the whole nation is praying. And I heard an ESPN analyst say um, later that week, isn't it amazing how so many people all of a sudden begin to throw words into the atmosphere? And I thought, time out, bro. I ain't throwing words into the atmosphere. I am declaring back to God, thus says the Lord, my faith isn't in what I think. My faith isn't what in what I feel. My faith is in what has God said, and my prayer life is built by faith. That's why I've got to get a word. That's why when I'm walking through hard times, I've got to know that the word says that he is a strong tower that I can run in into and find safety. God, I expect safety today in my life. Why? Because you're a strong tower that I run into. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't know what your house is gonna do. I don't know what your auntie's house is gonna do. But in the Floyd house, we are going to serve the Lord. But as for me and my children, they are gonna serve the Lord. As for me and my wife, we gonna serve the Lord. As for me and my grandchildren, we will serve the Lord. As for me and generation after generation after generation, cause I got a word, we will serve the Lord. And some of you, you need that word, why? Because you're the first generation of followers of Christ and on your knees you go, no, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm changing it all right now. But I can't go in prayer on what I feel because my feelings change from day to day. I need a word. Some days I've got to go. I will not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. I declare that over my life. For you, Father, I can do all things through Christ. I'm about to go into a meeting. I need more faith than I've ever had. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. God, I thank you today that you've been strengthened me today, not by my own strength, but by the strength of the Lord is in me today. I've got power. I've got courage. I've got faith today. And I'm not praying to God based on what I just, God, if you would think about it, maybe not. I don't know about y'all, I fight too many devils to be like, God, if you would, I ain't got time for that. I gotta come up in the, I gotta be like, God, your word said, I ain't got time to play. But faith is what makes prayer work. And I can't build faith without a word. Because faith comes by hearing. And hearing what? Hearing the word. Not somebody's opinion. Are you tracking with me? Not somebody else's thought. I appreciate your thought. I appreciate your encouragement. I appreciate whatever you want to say to me. But at the end of the day, when it all gets faded away, I'm going with the word. This is why the enemy wants to attack the word. That's why the enemy wants to say you can't trust the word. That's why the enemy wants to try to discredit the word of God. Are you following me? It's because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. He's not after the word. He's after your faith. We are not ignorant to the works of the enemy. He's coming after your faith. So it is a word that builds my faith. I got to begin with a word. If you're with me, say amen. amen. We're having fun today, everybody. So the story goes on. It hasn't rained for three and a half years. And then Elijah says in 1 Kings 18, 41, 42, he's like, I'm going to pray and turn the spigot back on. Funnier in my head. It didn't rain. I'm gonna pray. The rain. Okay, never. Mind. If I gotta explain, it's not funny anymore. 
It says, and Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink, for there's sound of a heavy rain. I don't know that anybody else heard the sound except Elijah, and I think the sound was in his spirit because there were no clouds in the sky. I'll show you that in a minute. It's in the text. I'm not just making it up. There were no clouds in the sky. But I think he heard the sound. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel. And I've, I've been up there, taken lots of our church up there. And um, it's, really, it's a really powerful, powerful moment. I think I'm going to take another trip in 2025. Just to give you a little, little, little start saving. Uh, don't use your tithe to go to Israel, God. <laughs> I ain't getting on the plane with you if you do. I don't want to go down. So he bent down to the ground. I'm joking. God doesn't work that way. Some of you, it's bad theology, really bad. <laughs> bent down to the ground and he put his face in between his knees. Number two, faith builds when we determine not to give up. Faith builds when we determine to not give up. It hadn't rained for three and a half years. Elijah goes, it's going to rain. I hear the sound of a, of a storm cloud. And, uh, and then he goes to the top of Mount Carmel. And he, he begins to pray and ask God to move. And so he gets on his knees and he gets on his face before God. And I just think, I think there's something about the posture of our heart expressed in our physical posture. There's nothing wrong with standing. There's nothing wrong. I just think there's something sometimes about the humbling place of God. I'm on my knees before you. I need you to move in my life. And so he's got his servant, his assistant with him. And in verse 43, the very next verse, he tells him, he says, go and look towards the sea. Now, from the top of Mount Carmel, you can see out to the Mediterranean Sea. It's a beautiful view. So he told his servant, he said, go look. And he went up and looked. And he, he comes back, he said, there's nothing, he said. And he does this seven times. Elijah said, go back. And the seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. So, so here's the, here's the, the picture. Y'all with me? Say amen. amen. So here, here's the, the image of what's happening is that Elijah is down on his knees and, and his, his, his guy there is with him, assisting him. And he's like, Elijah's praying. This is faith-filled prayer. Elijah's praying and he goes, go look. There's an expectation that there's going to be some rain. And he comes back and he goes, no, nothing. He goes, okay, we're going to keep praying. And he said, go check again. And he comes back and he's like, no, there's nothing. And he does this seven times. And the seventh time, he says, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. Now think about that for a moment. Like that, that's good preaching material, but just think about it for a moment. It hasn't rained in three and a half years, not a cloud in the sky, beautiful blue sky. Are y'all tracking with me? I mean, the, 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 the enormity of the sky on top, up top of a mountain and the servant comes back and goes, See a cloud this big. <laughs> it must have looked like a dot. Are y'all track? I mean, think about this logically for a minute. Like, it must have looked like a dot up in the sky, but it was enough for Elijah. He's like, good enough. Good enough. Some of us were waiting for God to like finish the whole story, complete the whole thing. And Elijah's like, no, I can go on the size of a man's hand. I can go on a cloud that's just that big. But here's what I want you to notice is that Elijah didn't stop until he saw with his eyes what God had said would happen with his mouth. Are y'all tracking with me? And some of us, we stop at time six. Elijah, get up. 
We done done this six times. We done prayed and nothing's happening. I haven't seen no cloud. Some of us were like, God, I done prayed one time and you haven't done anything. So I'm going, I ain't even coming back to church anymore. I ain't even showing up anymore because I prayed one time. Remember that one time we prayed? I came to 21 days of prayer and fasting one morning. And by the next day, my prayer card was not answered. I don't even know what was. I think about the nation of Israel who God said, march around the city seven times. And on the seventh time, I want you to lift up a shout and the walls will come falling down. I just had to imagine there had to have been some joker that was in that, that group walking around the city that on day six was like, I ain't even seen a pebble move, let alone a wall fall down. I ain't even seen a little dust up shake out of the wall. You really think on day seven, something's just gonna change because I did it another day. I walked around another time. I don't see anything happening. But no, Elijah goes, keep going back. Look again, look again. Israel, march again, go again. I just wanna stir something inside of you because some of you, you quit praying for your children. You stopped praying for that breakthrough. You stopped asking God to do it. And I just wanna say, Look again, go back again, pray again, say it again, believe again, fast again, get on your knees again, ask God again. Some of you are on the edge of a breakthrough and you're about to go home on lap six. You're about to go home because you looked in the sky a sixth time and you didn't see a cloud. I'm just saying, believe again, fast again, pray again, ask God again, trust again, get a word again, stand on the word again. Because the Bible says, meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. Meanwhile, what? While Ahab was getting his chariot hooked up and Elijah was coming off the mountain from prayer. I love this. Elijah came off the mountain from prayer because he had a cloud the size of a man's hand. It hadn't started raining yet, y'all. But he had a cloud. Some of y'all are waiting for a downpour to believe God. Elijah, go. See a cloud? Good enough for me. Let's go. It's coming. It said the winds rose, a heavy rain came on Ahab as Ahab rode off to Jezreel. And the Bible goes on to tell us that the power of God came upon Elijah. And he tucked his coat in his belt or I don't know what they had. He just tucked it somewhere. <laughs> and he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Think about that. A chariot was all of a sudden Elijah became flash. <laughs> Outran the chariot. Why? Here's why. Write this down. Break, faith breaks through the natural into the supernatural. It is faith that moves you from, I can do this. This is what I can accomplish. This is where I can get. No, it's faith that moves you beyond the best that you can do into the best that God can do. It moves you beyond the natural into the supernatural. It moves you beyond, I've tried everything I know to do. Well, with faith in God, it moves you into the supernatural. It's why in the book of Matthew, it says, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Well, pastor, I don't, I, that, that, no, I've, I've studied the Greek, all means all, and that's all all means. Your situation isn't excluded. Well, mine's gone too far. This marriage will never be restored. This thing will never be broken in my life. I'll never get breakthrough in my life. Yeah, with your strength, you're right. And with your best ability, you're right. And with you trying to manipulate it, you're right. And you trying to figure it out, you're right. But the moment you bring faith, you invite the supernatural into your life. And we serve a supernatural God. And then James takes a hard right turn and ends with this. You still with me? 
He talks all about prayer. And then he ends with this verse at the end. He says, brothers and sisters, if any of you should wonder from the truth and someone brings that person back, remember this. So he says, if you've walked away and you bring them back, he said, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Here's what James is saying to close out this book. He goes, at the end of the day, um, taming your tongue is good. Learning to walk through trials is good. Learning to live from a bigger picture, eternal perspective is good. But if you haven't resolved eternal life, the rest of it really doesn't matter. He's saying, listen, at the end of the day, what really matters is eternal life. What really matters is where will you spend eternity? What really matters is where are you with Jesus? Because here's the deal, when we talk about faith, we all have faith. I hear people say, I just don't have faith, pastor. Well, that's not true, you do. The Bible says he's given, administered a measure of faith to everybody. Everybody has a measure of faith. I mean, you have a measure of faith. The fact that you sat in the seats today, you have faith that they'll hold you. I didn't see any of you sit down and go, good, it's gonna hold me. No, we don't do that, why? We just have a measure of faith. And your faith is being placed in something right now. Some of it's in your good works. I've just decided my works are not good enough. I need Jesus. Some of them are in your network. Some of it's in your net worth. Some of it's in, in the hopes. I'm placing my faith that one day I'll get to heaven and my good will outweigh my bad, which it won't, just FYI. We're all placing our faith in something. I'm just inviting you, and James is inviting you, to place your faith in what Jesus has done for you on the cross. The Bible says that we've all sinned, and that's not a condemning statement. You hear me say that every week. It's the reality of the human condition. Born into us, we're born with it. And it says the wages of our sin is death. That means eternal separation from a loving God. God never wanted it that way. I hear people say, how could a loving God send people to hell? And I would say, God doesn't. He never has, never will. People choose to go there. And to go there, they have to walk over the cross. God never sent anybody to hell. He never wanted anybody to go to hell. So much so that he let his own son be murdered on a cross to make a way for you to never have to visit a horrible place like that. And the way that we receive this free gift, he gives us this gift of salvation, is you receive it by faith. And here's what I know about gifts, is that, because I love giving gifts, like I'm a good gift giver. If you ever get a gift from me, you'll love it. I'm not being arrogant, I just, I, it's a gift. I have to give gifts. I'll study you, I'll research you, I'll figure out you, and then I'll give you the thing that you're gonna be like. The downside of that is I'm a horrible gift receiver. Because if I don't like it, it shows all over my face. <laughs> I cannot fake it. You give me a gift, I'll be like, thank you. Here, Owen. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> Think about a gift is that I can have the gift for you. I can extend the gift to you. You can even be in a gift giving room and never receive it. Because to receive it, you gotta take it. And you gotta open it so that you can experience it. And some of you, you've been in the gift giving room Sunday after Sunday. And you've had the gift extended. I extend it every single week. And you've even looked at it and considered it, but you've never received it for yourself. And that's what faith does. Faith says, by faith, I'm taking what Jesus did for me on the cross and believing that it will cleanse all of my sin. I wanna invite you to do that today at every campus. It's the joy of my life. The greatest thing I do all week is this. I get to offer you a gift. It's the greatest gift exchange ever. It's not like the bad ones at your business or, your, or that one you have to go to with your family. It's the greatest gift exchange. You give him all your sin, he gives you all of his rightness. We get the good end of the bargain. 
I'm gonna invite you to do that. With every head bowed, every eye closed across all of our campuses. If you'd say, Pastor, that's me today. I, I wanna know that my sins are forgiven and that I have a brand new start with Jesus today. I need that even online today. And as I talked about the gift exchange, you realize you've never done that. You're, you're, you're trusting in your good works or your best effort or something that'll get you there or, or hoping one day it'll all pan out in the end and it won't. And today you, you wanna receive the free gift of Jesus. In just a moment, we're gonna pray together as a church and we wouldn't embarrass you for the world. No one's gonna come to you, but I'm gonna count to three. And when I do, I believe that's just your way of saying, I believe today I'm receiving that gift. And so at every location, no one looking around, only myself or your campus pastor, we just wanna know who we're praying with today. When I count to three, this is your moment. This is why God has you here today. You say, pastor, that's me. I wanna be included in that prayer in just a moment. I wanna know that I have a fresh start today. I wanna know that heaven's my home. If that's you, when I count to three, you just shoot your hand up real high. On three, one, two, three. Shoot it up. God bless you. God bless you. I see you. I see you in the uppers all around. It's beautiful. You can put them down. Church, let's pray this out loud together at every campus, even online, for the benefit of those who just slip their hand up. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I thank you for dying for me. I thank you that God raised you from the dead. Today I make you my Lord and Savior, and I receive by faith the gift of salvation. Thank you for a brand new beginning. In Jesus' name, everybody said a big amen. Come on, every campus, let's celebrate those.